Hi, in this video we're going to talk about volumes of rotation. So, similar to the previous video, we're going to be graphing the area in between two functions. Then we're going to take that area and rotate it around, say, the x-axis maybe, or some other line like x equals 1 or y equals 2 or something like that. But the point is, is that we're going to have a three-dimensional volume. And our job is going to be to find the amount of that volume. As usual, we will be testing your basic graphing skills so make sure that stuff is up to speed. First we need a couple of basic facts in order to do rotations. As you know the area of a circle is determined by its radius using the formula pi r squared. In this section we will frequently refer to circles as disks. This next shape is called a washer and it has a hole in the middle. What's the area of a washer? We'll call the little radius associated to the hole little r and the big radius associated to the whole object big r. See if you can take a few minutes and figure out what is the area for formula for a washer on your own. The answer is that I take the area of the whole big circle which is pi big R squared, and I subtract off the area of the whole, pi little r squared. So the area of a disk is pi r squared, and the area of a washer is pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. Here's how volumes of rotations work. Now suppose that we wanted to take this region here and rotate it around the x-axis. What will happen when this rotates is that it's coming out of the screen towards you in three dimensions, rotates around around the x-axis back into the screen in order to create a three-dimensional volume of rotation. Now in order to draw this on the two-dimensional screen here, the first trick is to draw the mirror image on the other side of the axis of rotation. Now what we're going to do is pick any dot on the function and another dot, a mirror image of it below, and connect this with circles. We can do that a couple of times. Now we can see our three-dimensional object object that we created to look something like this. And it's filled in, it's a solid object, and our goal here is to find its volume. Let's consider how we could do this with an idea similar to Riemann sums. If we subdivided the x-axis into pieces, then we could find the volume of a little disk that has a small change in x height. That would be like taking this three-dimensional figure here and slicing it perpendicular. Each slice is a disk. So what is the volume of that disk? My disks look something like this, with a little height or a width of change in x. So that width of the disk should be multiplied times the area of this circle. Of course, the area of this circle is pi r squared. So what is the radius here? The radius goes from the center of the circle out to the edge of the circle. That height right there is exactly f of x. So each disk has its own radius of f of x. So if we did it in a Riemann sum type fashion, we would add up all of those volumes. Say if I was doing a left Riemann sum, it would go from zero to n minus one as usual. And finally, we take the limit as n goes to infinity. So here, n is the number of disks instead of being the number of rectangles like we saw in previous videos. Okay, so similar to the previous video, this is where the formula comes from. The formula that we're actually going to use on a day-to-day basis is the easy integral formula. Now what is this formula in terms of an integral? The change in x turns into the dx. After you take the limit as n goes to infinity, this summation sign turns into an integral sign. So what's left? The stuff that goes inside the integral is pi f of x squared. This is our new formula. From x equals a to x equals b. There's a warning about this formula. This only works for rotating regions around the x-axis. When we're rotating around the x-axis, the radius is the f of x function. Now if we had rotated around some other axis, say around the y equals negative 1 line, which is a little bit lower, then our rotation would have to go a little bit farther and our picture would be a little bit bigger. But the point is, is that the radius would not be f of x. It would be something else depending on that picture. But what we do have from this picture is sort of instructions for what to do in general. The volume of this region is equal to an integral, and the thing that I'm integrating here is exactly the area of a slice of the figure. So no matter what your picture
picture looks like, the volume of the rotation figure will be the integral of area of a slice. So I'll just write it as a of x. That's the general formula. All right, so here's the problem we're gonna do is rotating the region bounded by e to the x, x equals zero, x equals one, y equals zero, around the x-axis. In order to draw this, I really have to read carefully. We need to draw e to the x, x equals zero. That's a vertical line and x equals one. That's a vertical line as well. Y equals zero is the bottom part over here. So here's the region in question. Now we're gonna rotate that around the x-axis. I treat that axis of rotation like a mirror and I draw the mirror image on the other side. Even if the drawing's not that great, it's okay. Now after I have the mirror image drawn on the other side, I pick a dot on the function and the mirror image of that dot on the other side and I connect it with an oval. Do that again, maybe on the endpoints, and I'll start to see my three-dimensional figure. That slice, that circle has area pi r squared. The radius is the distance from here to here. That is exactly the height of the e to the x function. Remember a power raised to a power, we multiply the powers, so here we're getting pi e to the 2x. So our volume formula will be the integral from x equals 0 to x equals 1 of the area pi e to the 2x with respect to x. As you can see, the drawing and figuring out the integral is the hardest part of the problem. From there, you should be able to calculate it pretty easily. Pulling the pi out, I want to take the antiderivative of e to the 2x. That gives me e to the 2x over 2. And now I want to plug in 1 and 0 and subtract. Don't forget e to the 0 is 1. So here is my final answer. It's recommended that you simplify your answers as much as possible. This is the volume of the figure. Make sure you do get a positive number for your final answer. E squared is something like 2.7 squared. That's definitely bigger than 1, right? So our final answer is positive. The volume is positive. So things are making sense. On the previous slide, our cross sections were circles. So the function that we were integrating was pi times the radius of the circle squared. On the next slide, we'll do an example where the cross sections are washers. So the quantity that we're going to be integrating in that case is pi big radius squared minus pi little radius squared. Remember, it's all about the cross sections. If the cross section is a circle, you integrate pi r squared. If the cross section is a washer, you integrate pi big r squared minus pi little r squared. Okay, so here's a new problem. We're going to take the region bounded by x squared plus 1 and x plus 1, and we're going to rotate that region around the line y equals 3. Now the function x squared plus 1 should look like a parabola x squared shifted up by one unit. The line x plus 1 has y-intercept 1 and slope 1. The region that's about to get rotated is here. What are the boundaries of this region? What are the x values of these two dots on the edge of the region? In order to find that, we should set x squared plus 1 equal to x plus 1. What we find here is that the 1's cancel, and if we subtract x onto the left side of the equation, we can factor this and get x times x minus 1 is equal to 0. So it looks like there's two intersection points that agree with our picture, x equals 0 and x equals 1. Okay, now for the rotation, we need to rotate around the line y equals 3. So where is that line on the picture? This is important. If the line y equals 3 is below the shaded area, then we would be rotating downwards. If the line y equals 3 is above of the shaded area, then we would be rotating upwards. Okay, so we really need to think about this. Let's do a little bit more labeling. This point here is at 1. Plugging into the functions, I get a y value of 2. Okay, so it looks like y equals 3 is above the shaded region. Let's say approximately here. And the axis of rotation is like our mirror. Okay, so here's the mirror image of our region. Okay, so let's draw our circles. How we get the cross sections is we pick some points on the edge of the shaded region, draw their mirror images down below, and then we connect those dots with circles. The inner circle is like a big hole. There's no shaded region that is in the center of this picture. However, the outer circle does contain some area here. Our cross sections are washers. Every tiny little piece will get rotated around in order to give a washer. There's a 
bunch of washers. Okay, all in all, we have some sort of three-dimensional object that looks kind of like some sort of a mountain with a hole in it. So let's find the volume. The volume formula is we need to integrate here from x equals zero to x equals one because those are the boundaries. I like to think of it like the leftmost washer is here, then there's another washer on top of that, another washer on top, and I keep stacking them from left to right, starting at x equals zero and ending at x equals one. And because those are x values, this is gonna be an integration with respect to x. Now we need to check out the inner radius and the outer radius. Let's do the inner radius first. Y equals three is a flat line at the center of the circle here. So the distance from here to here, the total distance is three. The distance from the x axis up to that blue line, that is x plus one. So it looks like our inner radius is a total of three and subtracting x plus one. In order to get the outer radius, which goes from here all the way out to the edge, the red outer radius, that length is a total of three and subtract x squared plus one. This whole quantity inside the integral is the area of a washer. And now we have to calculate this integral. Don't forget to be super careful about constants and parentheses. The first thing I'm gonna do is pull the pi out in front of the whole quantity, and then inside the parentheses, let's distribute the minus sign and simplify. Continuing to simplify, and now let's foil everything and continue to simplify. Notice that I haven't taken the antiderivative yet. All I'm doing is simplify, simplify, simplify until I can't simplify anymore. Carefully distributing minus signs. And now let's collect terms. Looks like some fours cancel here. The highest power is x to the fourth. The x squared terms will add up to give minus five x squared. And we've also got a plus four x. Okay, now we're as simple as possible and we are ready to take the antiderivative. Now I'm plugging in one and plugging in zero and subtracting. Looks like our final answer is eight pi over 15. And that positive number represents the volume of the three dimensional figure on the previous slide. See if you can go read some extra material in the book before you come to class. Here's what I want you to read about. Suppose that you had some region. In this case, let's suppose that the axis of rotation is a vertical line instead of a horizontal line. Using that line as my mirror, this is now going to get rotated this way. Drawing the mirror image on the other side, we get something like this. And now our cross sections or our slices are washers again, but they're in the other direction. Now we have every Y value is a slice. So if I wanted to find the volume of this region, I would do an integration with respect to Y. From the bottom Y value, where I start stacking the washers up to the top y value. Now those y values might change depending on the problem. And then the quantity that you're integrating is of course the area of the washer as usual, except this time the area of the washer is gonna be a function of y. Okay, so that involves finding the distance from here to there and taking the equation of this line and instead of writing it as y equals a function of x, rearrange it just like the previous video. In order to get x is a function of y. So you can get the radius of the cross section as a function of y and then integrate with respect to y. Okay, so that's the general idea for rotating around a vertical line. So for this video, read in the book some extra examples for integration with respect to y. Because once you get to class, we're going to do a bunch of problems integrating with respect to x and with respect to y. We'll be doing disks and washers and you'll get a chance to work with your classmates on these challenging problems. So I hope you enjoyed this video on volumes of rotation. So remember, start the homework super early, get stuff done even before you come to class, and you can get extra help in class. We'll see you soon.